Good afternoon, and welcome to the Small Business Town Hall conversation. We're so glad that you're joining us today. Uh, again, my name is Sabina Matos. I'm the Lieutenant Governor for the state of Rhode Island, and I continue to go to every city and town in the state of Rhode Island, uh, visiting the 39 cities and towns, and I was so glad to spend some time in Barrowville, in um, North, North um, Kingston, so I've been going to several of the uh, cities and towns, and I may be coming to your city and towns soon. So thank you for joining us. It's so great to hear directly from the businesses um, in person in, in to hear how things are going and what else can we do to make sure that the state of, of Rhode Island is responding to your needs. So we have an important conversation today. And we're going to have joining me as a co-host is going to be the Secretary Stephen Pryor is going to be joining me. Um, also, Chris Barisi is going to be joining me for the conversation. And as always, we have the Director of the Department of Labor and Training, Matt Weldon. And I just want to hear first from Director Weldon how things are going, what is new and what is happening. Governor, how are you? Good. So good to see you, Director. It's good to see you as well. Uh, I saw that you were out on Block Island recently. I too spent some time on Block Island. It was great. I didn't see any of those shocks, so that was a good thing. Uh, but things are going well here at DLT. I'm back at it. We're busy, but we're a little less busy than we were before, which tells me that people are going back to work. That's good. So that, that's a good thing. Yeah. So we've talked about this a number of times. Um, you know, the federal programs, which have helped a lot of people throughout the pandemic, are scheduled to end on September 4th. So that means that most people collecting payments won't be eligible anymore. And the, the reason for that is that uh, most people are on either the federal programs that were created, which is the pandemic unemployment program for gig workers, self-employed people, people that own their own businesses, or people that just don't qualify for unemployment usually. Uh, those people won't be eligible anymore after September 4th. Uh, the extra $300 that everybody's got at now for quite a bit, it used to be 600, it became 300. That ends on September 4th as well. And then finally, the one that I think is the, the most difficult uh, for other people to understand is the federal government added a lot of extensions, which are uh, basically made regular unemployment claims longer. So for somebody who's an employee, like a regular W-2 employee that would go on unemployment, their claim can be for up to 26 weeks in Rhode Island. It's okay. different in every state up to 26 weeks, whatever you qualify for. I saw one yesterday that was 17 weeks, sometimes they're 20 weeks. When those weeks end, usually that's it. That's the end of the claim and you can't file again until the next benefit year. Well, the federal government added a bunch of weeks into this during the pandemic. Yeah. And so you could collect you know, much longer. And now everybody can collect until September 4th, but then those weeks end. So even if somebody thought they had a legitimate claim, it will come to an end. The only people that will keep collecting are people that file new claims and have those first 26 weeks available. So what does that mean? It means people need to get back to work. Our economy has been fully reopened. Vaccines uh, have been rolled out. There are still vaccines available. And as we tell everyone, go get vaccinated, yes. please, and get back to work. You can't wait until the programs end to try to get a job. You need to do that now. And even if it's not a full-time job, even if you're going to get a bridge job to get back into the economy, go for it. Yeah. Go to backtoworkri.com. Go to dlt.ri.gov. And you can get the information you need to connect with a job immediately. We have about 58,000 people on benefits. That's 10,000 people fewer than we had when we started requiring people to look for work again. We know when we changed that law, Governor, to allow people to make more money and still collect, uh, since then about 2,500 people have qualified for a payment that they wouldn't have qualified before. Another 2,900 people have told us that they're working and making more, even though we changed the law. So that basically means they've gone back full time. Almost 9,000 people have held on to more of their own money. They've maximized their family income, which is exactly what you and Governor McKee were talking about doing that whole time. Yeah. We're trying to make sure that families are able to sustain during these difficult times. And 9,200 people have reported that they're working at least some hours while they're collecting unemployment. So that's good. Those are all good things. It shows us that week over week, it's made a difference. But Thank now so we're on a clock, six weeks left, and the benefits end. So we need people to get back to work. Uh, I just want to thank you so much, Director. And I want to tell you that I've been getting um, a conversation that I've that been having with small businesses. I just was part of a conversation with 
uh, women-owned businesses, small business for the, from the Goldman Sachs 10,000 um, small business group. And the conversation that we had in Newport, um, that was the topic that was coming up. Every, every conversation was, what about um, the employees? It's so hard to find employees. And actually one of the, um, of the small business owner used a terminology that I told her I was gonna tell you, now we got a report on this. I was asking if they were having flex time for their employees, right? And she said, well, I have the full-time, part-time and sometimes. So from now on, and we want to get a report on the sometimes also. How's that going? Okay. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but that's the number one, uh, the number one question that I'm getting from the business community is um, how we can get um, employers. So any any programs that we can share um, in, during the next uh, time when we come together about what options employees have, job fairs, any details like that, that would be really helpful. Sure. And for any anybody who's a job seeker or any employer that participates in these sessions, go to backtoworkri.com. Employers can sign up for a free account. We can help you host a virtual job fair or we can do an in-person job fair. We can talk to you about what might help you attract some employees. And right now, quite frankly, Governor, it's a, it's a job seekers market. And so we know people are going back to work, but they may not be going to work in certain businesses or industries. You know, businesses have to be competitive right now. And if you can go work at one place and make more money than somewhere else, then that's going to be a discussion that has to be had. But we can certainly help out and try to let people know what maybe market rates are, uh, what kind of benefits people are offering, and we can talk about how to get them employees quickly. Yes, actually, um, based on the conversation that I had, they really had some competitive uh, wages um, that they were offering, but it still was challenges for them to find employees. So. Any any additional information we can provide that would be great. If we maybe we can have a conversation. Oh, you want Chris? Actually, why don't we bring Chris Parisi on? Chris, is, is Ben is Chris are there with us? Hi, Chris. I'm sorry, I got you a little bit off guard, but I just wanted to bring Ben. Can you bring Director Weldon also, please? So the three of us to have this chat. Thank you. So, um, Chris, um, I had this conversation. It was like a round table, square table of uh, small business owners, female, all of them. And we were talking about the challenges of finding employees. So it would be great if you and Director Weldon maybe can collaborate on having one of this um, town halls uh, conversation in a week that it can be just all about uh, resources for employers um, and how to do job fairs and any other options available what do you think yeah i think that's a great idea a great idea because it is still one of the top issues facing small businesses i know as director weldon just mentioned the back to work website i believe ben had it on earlier we actually i personally am a small business owner and i had someone from uh, matt's team from the business services side reach out to me proactively and uh, try to support, hey, what's your problems? What's your issues? Do you want to do an online job fair? I think the small businesses need to use the resources available that the best that they can that are available to them. And uh, Director Weldon, correct me if I'm wrong, would you say the back to work website would be the best way for them to get started? Absolutely, it's the best way and it's free. So one of the things I try to tell businesses all the time, you don't need to pay a company to advertise your jobs. You don't need to you know, go onto other job boards. Come to the state service and let us provide a service for you. And I'm glad that my team member did that, uh, Chris, and we can totally tailor make programs for people. Uh, we have a whole team of people that are able to do that and I can get more people to help as well. But backtoworkri.com is the single best resource. Great. Yeah, and we'll uh, talk offline about how we can, you know, communicate to the small business community ways to help, you know, them find employees as well as the um, employees find jobs to get back to work. Because as you said, was it six weeks left? Yeah. And that's, once that six weeks left, I don't think 
if everyone thinks that they're just going to magically find a job, it's not going to happen. I mean, they're going to look for jobs today to secure that employment because, you know, more small businesses will go under if we continue to wait six more weeks if they're unable to operate. Um, and we want to make sure that Rhode Islanders, you know, are able to get that job. So start looking for a job now and, and visit that website, backtoworkri.com and any other resource to ensure that we're working together to help our uh, small business economy. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Director. So I'm looking forward to that presentation, having your team from the Back to Work uh, giving us all the details of everything that they have available. Sure. Thank you for the information. Truly appreciate it. So great seeing you as always. And now, Chris, tell us what's going on. Well, first, before I tell us what's going on, I want to say you're doing a great job visiting all 39 cities and towns. I saw you Thank recently you. Where, where I currently live now in Barrington at the wonderful yes. Barrington Books. I get a, a lot of birthday presents there. Um, Me too. Actually, I'm going to tell you something. I'm a last minute shopper, right? <laughs> Me too. And I used to go to the one in Garden City, which is not there anymore. I just learned recently that they just merged. So I used to go there and I was able to do a lot of Christmas shopping right in one location. <laughs> <laughs> I know you'll have to come to, to Barrington. I and, will. <laughs> uh, and I saw you at the Umbrella Factory. That was That is such a unique Rhode Island type shop that has many little small businesses together, which is great. Actually, I'm showing off my earrings today. I got this from a, <laughs> oh, native, a beautiful. native American store within the Umbrella Factory. I just love the place never been there i'm discovering so many amazing places on this in the state of rhode island it's just great right you know the rhode island has a, a lot of um great small businesses that brings its character and that was a great purchase matches your dress very well right. um Thanks. too so um but but talking about the coalition you know mm -hmm. we're looking at the industries and type of businesses that are still struggling from the pandemic and thinking about how we can support them what type of economic recovery programs can be developed with the great folks at commerce and and other you know agencies and organizations um you know there's industries like the indoor recreation you know think about how much that has been impacted. Not too many people are going into, um, you know, an arcade or, or bowling mm -hmm. or something like that and child services, venues, nightlife. But one that's been hit really hard from the beginning and hasn't received as much help as the other hard hit industries is the travel industry. Uh, so, for instance, we have coalition members as travel agents that rely on international travel and business travel, which is much lower than in 2019. And even though domestic travel has recovered somewhat to pre-pandemic levels, if you compare it to the same time in 2019, it is 18% less. Yes. And all of this relates to tourism, which is you know, my segue into your next uh, segment with the great guests coming on. That's right. um, and, and I recently went to Newport with my wife on Sunday and it was busy. It was great to see all of the people walking around and, you know, going into the hotels and eating and drinking and visiting the local shops. It just shows how tourism really affects the overall economy. Um, and, you know, and, and it's something that's so important to focus on and how we can build and recover because that international and business travel, which before the pandemic made a majority, uh, more than half of the flights coming into Rhode Island, uh, into TF Green for non-Rhode Islanders, world is changing. They're not gonna come back ever again to pre-pandemic. There's gonna be more, there's gonna be less business travel. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. So we got a shift, you know, which I know the governor is focusing on more of a tourism campaign to make that Rhode Island as that destination, you know, for your travels, whether you're a local visitor or, you know, coming from outside the region and staying overnight. Um, because it was, I was doing some research. The traveler economy in Rhode Island surpassed nine, seven billion dollars in 2019. Wow. So it's a critical component of our overall economic health that affects small businesses tremendously, yeah. as I just saw, you know, Sunday in Newport and all over the state, you know, Providence obviously hasn't quite recovered in that tourism mm -hmm. and hospitality as some of those, you know, Southern half of our beautiful state. So thank you so much, uh, Chris. Actually, yes, that's our next topic. We're gonna be talking about the tourism industry here in Rhode Island. 
And in order to, to make that conversation, we have to bring the Secretary of Commerce. You know, it's all of, it's all about making sure <laughs> that our tourism industry is prosperous and um, we're bringing people to Rhode Island. So Secretary Stephen Pryor, thank you for joining us in this conversation. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Matos, really appreciate it. And Chris, thank you as always for your leadership and for your collaboration. <clears throat> this is such a crucial topic, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, Chris has really touched upon it. Uh, we have seen a healthy restoration of our tourism industry, but there's a long way to go for certain segments of the industry. Some businesses are still struggling. Some of our jurisdictions are still struggling. Providence is a great example where business travel is such a big part of it. And because of the trends that Chris is describing accurately, uh, we're still having problems with uh, the level of tourism visitation in greater Providence. But we're pleased that we did as a state stay at it mm -hmm. during the pandemic. And what I mean is that we, we created a new effort to promote Rhode Island called Hit the Open Road, R-H-O-D-E, and it appeared in a lot of places. Uh, and we ended up with 70, uh, six, excuse me, $67.6 .6 million ad impressions during the pandemic, July 2020 to February 2021 led to 148,000 ho direct hotel bookings. You can see where the clicks lead to, mm -hmm. um, which uh, resulted in um, all kinds of economic activity. $22 million in value uh, are, are attributed to those hotel bookings. We had 129 features and outlets like travel and leisure, coastal living. So Google tracks who's trending mm -hmm. for travel and they're tracking who's trending for summer 2021, just based upon people's Google searches and obviously the empirical analytics that accompany them. We're in the top 10 in Newport, Rhode Island. We're in the top 10 trending destinations great. in the United States. So these are great things. That's and what great. Chris just witnessed in Newport, I've seen it too. I'm right with you, Chris. Um, it's, it's happening. You might even say it's booming, certainly compared to the pandemic. We need to make sure that all over the state that's true. And Lieutenant Governor and Chris, we need to make sure that during the so-called shoulder seasons, beyond the summer, when things get a little bit more dormant, a little bit more calm, we still have a steady flow of visitation for Rhode Island. So our image has to stay out there throughout the year. So um, Lieutenant Governor, there's a lot of work left to do, but I'm so pleased that you're focusing upon it and we will continue to do so under the governor and your leadership. Thank you, Secretary, and we are so glad that you're there leading this work also. So uh, we have uh, two guests that are gonna be joining us right now, and I wanted to introduce them and bring them on. It's Trudy Cox, who is the CEO and Executive Director of the Preservation Society of Newport County, who oversees 11 historic public buildings in Newport, including the, big, uh, the Breakers, the Elms, and the Rosecliffe. So welcome, Trudy. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Governor. In the welcome, Trudy. Hi. Hello, Stefan. <laughs> nice to see you once again. And next, we bring in Joe Bile, who is the Executive Director of the Southern Rhode Island Chamber of Commerce. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, and, and we would like to hear from you directly what is happening in the tourism industry from your perspective. And um, I want to welcome both of you and just want to hear from you. What are some of the challenges you're facing um, this summer? I'm happy to start if you don't mind, or Joe, you can go. Um, go right ahead. First of all, I want to give a tip of the hat to Stefan Pryor because uh, the Preservation Society, the Newport Mansions, were opened in June of 2020. So we were the first museum in the state to open. We opened the Breakers and the Elms. Um, I, our staff, I commend them because they were out on the front line very early on the game. And um, as a result, Lieutenant Governor, we were able to um, welcome uh, close to 230,000 visitors last year, um, which was is a remarkable number. Now, granted, in 2019, during the, that year, we, um, we gave a million tours, so we were off by about 75%. But still, that 25% um, kept the organization going. And I also um, want to give a tip of the hat to Stefan because he offered a program called Take It Outside or Take It Outdoors. 
which allowed us to finance um, sparkling lights at the breakers all through November and December. And it, it, was spectacular. Fed, it fed into people's desire to be outside, but also to have something to do that was safe. And so the whole front yard of the breakers was lit up. It was beautiful. And we have a wonderful old path that's recently been restored. And we just served uh, chocolate with some kind of liquor in it and hot chocolate. And it really was popular. So a lot of people would come to the breakers, walk the path, enjoy the lights. Some would go inside, some would stay outside, but they were out and about. They were trying very hard to live a normal life. They were enjoying Rhode Island. So we would not have been able to do that had it not been for the state's help in getting us open first back in June of 2020, and then secondly, providing new opportunities for visitors. It is still tough. Um, we have, we will, as of next week, have five of our 11 houses open, um, but we are seeing good numbers right now. July is turning out to be a fantastic month for us, which is great. Um, and it's due to the fact that Green Animals is open and there's an exhibition of big bugs and children love that. Uh, it's due to the fact that we've got several spectacular houses open, but we still have a long way to go. We're not discouraged though, Lieutenant Governor. I think that the state is doing tremendous things to encourage people to try to live a normal life. That's what this is all about. Try your best to live a normal life, enjoy life, Get out there, do it safely, and there are places you can do it. And the Newport Mansions happen to be one of those places. Thank you, Trudy. So I would like to hear from Joe, and then I'm going to pass it over to my co-host, uh, Stephen Pryor. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So uh, I'm happy to report that the uh, activity this year certainly is a lot more than last year, although we did get an awful lot of um, telephone activity from out-of-staters, out-of-state tourists. Who were coming here last uh, last summer, but they weren't coming in the same numbers, certainly, and they weren't uh, coming as often. So this year, we're seeing an awful lot of people who are pre-planning. So they're calling us from, frankly, all over the country. Um, some of them are actually um, making their plans for, say, a Newport vacation, but, he, but they really want to know about uh, West Bay and what's available uh, a few people have told me they're sort of splitting their va vacation between Newport and Southern Rhode Island. Um, and then um, real time, these tourists are here. They sort of have been here since probably late May. And I think it's a little more obvious to us uh, because the weather hasn't been great. So they're not necessarily on the beach every day. So they're, they're here for a seven day stay and they're discovering a lot more the area where they may have in the in past vacation spent three or four hours a day on the beach in the first half of the day or the second half of the day and done their exploring. They're doing a lot more exploring. Uh, so the weather, you know, it, it, it's sort of a dull edge. They, they don't like that the weather's not great, but they're taking the opportunity to um, take advantage of other sectors of tourism, right? So we know hospitality, um, uh, hotels, restaurants, also distilleries and breweries and any attractions. They are busier this year. The biggest challenge I'm hearing from all of them is labor. Um, and so the labor challenge is real and it doesn't seem to be improving for the first time uh, in my memory. Uh, in the southern part of the state, we have restaurants, for instance, that are closing one or two days a week or I just talked to one this morning who's not open for lunch except for Friday, Saturday, Sunday, because there just frankly isn't enough labor. Uh, the other part of, um, uh, you uh, you can sort of um, explain this as tourism because there are people that used to have second homes here and they took advantage in 2020 when they lived in maybe uh, Southwestern Connecticut or South shore of Jersey uh, their kids were on distance learning. They relocated to their summer home and they have figured, some of them have figured a way to relocate here, do their distance 
working, right? So they're zooming in three or four days a week. Then they're taking taking the train to work maybe one or two days a week. Um, some have actually sold their first home and they've relocated here. And so that's that sort of has it's not not what you think of typically as tourism, but it's driving the trades, right? So these people are coming here and then they're improving their second home. So it's sort of a boost to the economy there that uh, was un unexpected. We were never closed from the beginning of the pandemic. We we're always here. Some employees were working remotely, um, but someone was always here to answer the phone or or we're st we're getting so much more walk-in trade this year. Uh, they're just coming into our tourism center to get brochures and information. Uh, frankly, I think a lot of the restaurants didn't think that they would be this open this quickly, right? If you asked them back in April, yeah. they would have said, okay, it's going to be a better summer, but not um, not what it is. So there's, the, you, you know, so that's the double-edged edged sword. You really want to be back to full capacity, but you want to be able to handle the volume. And so a lot of the business owners are having a real problem with labor and being able to handle the volume. Um, but I will tell you that this is one of the strongest business communities I've ever been. And I was in business for over 40 years. Uh, one of the strongest business communities and they really sort of, um, you know, help to raise all ships. They help each other wherever it's needed. Um, so that's sort of it in a nutshell. We're seeing a lot more activity this year and it's, it's different because of the weather. So the people are in the communities more. Um, so that's sort of, sort of the snapshot here. Thank you, Joe. And, and I want to add something that you mentioned about the experience that some of the tour, tourists are looking for from the Western Rhode Island. And I know this, the secretary is going to tell us more about this because I'm so looking forward to this selling the Rhode Island experience. I went to Block Island and I was just amazed to see the beauty and how a wonderful time um, you can have in Block Island. But also I have been to Westerly and I know there's some wonderful things happening in Westerly. And you mentioned brewery. I went to a brewery in Boroughville. So mm -hmm. there's so many places that we can just sell the Rhode Island, Rhode Island experience. So I just want to hear from the secretary and my co-host, what do you think, how's things going? I, I think that Joe really hit on it, that it may be a good problem to have, but it's a problem. And it doesn't make it feel any more favorable that we, we, have, we have a labor shortage. Now, Director Matt Weldon was just speaking to it. Uh, we have one of the most innovative policies under the governor and yourself, Lieutenant Governor, uh, to get people back to work. We've required the work search to kick back in. We provide flexibility in the administration of the benefits, attaching the $300 to more individuals who are returning to work. And the time is running out, so we're trying to get the message out about that as pertains to UI. Uh, but we need to keep at it. And the fact that it's a good problem to have uh, doesn't mean that it isn't enormously challenging. Uh, so we've got to stay very close to our business community, ensure that we have the workforce. And then there are ge ge geographic discrepancies, and I mentioned it earlier, including the fact that our capital city and surrounding area is having a great deal of trouble attracting people back. In some instances, restaurants are doing very, very well, but not in all instances are they experiencing what Joe just laid out and what Trudy's now experiencing at her majestic mansions? So if I may, Lieutenant Governor, I want to ask a question of both Trudy and Joe, which is that we've heard the labor point and you can reemphasize it. There's a need to continue to discuss it, but what would be in your top two or three for things the state ought to keep doing or newly do to help support tourism going forward as we emerge from this pandemic? I think um, one of the things, um, well, first of all, keep a steady course on uh, current po policy regarding employment because um, we, we too, like Joe mentioned, like all of you have mentioned, we did struggle to, we, we hired, I think in the last six weeks, about 70 people. Um, some of them were people who had to be laid off and were very, very glad to come back. And others are just people looking for jobs, very happy. Um, but it is work. It is work to bring people back and I'm not complaining. It's just a, a fact. But I think that, you know, Rhode Island and Lieutenant Governor Matos, you, you may appreciate this, is one of those underappreciated jewels. We're kind of stuck between New York and Boston and we get lost and people confuse us with Long Island. 
And Rhode Island is an extraordinarily beautiful state from the beaches of South County to the mansions in Newport to really Providence is an elegant, elegant city, waterfront city, by the way, with things like water fire and you can walk along the river. And then um, my COVID experience was to walk the North South Trail along the Western part of Rhode Island um, from Charleston up to Burrowville. It took nine days and it was uh, not nine days consecutively. Uh, but the Western part of Rhode Island is absolutely beautiful. 78 miles of it, beautiful, beautiful countryside. I mean, you could be in Alaska for all you know. And so there is a lot to offer and the state can't tell our story enough. I think it does it very well, but we have to tell it even more. This is a great place, not only to come as a visitor, but as Joe is experiencing it, we're experiencing it here in Newport. People are now making this their first home. These are people with money who are making this their first home. And I think that that is very encouraging. People who used to come for two weeks to Newport stayed all through the pandemic and found that they love this. Why have an apartment in New York when you can live in Rhode Island? We got to get the message out. This is a good place to live. So definitely. And uh, Lieutenant Governor, if you don't mind, I'm going to interject one to you, Joe, and ask you that same question. But uh, uh, Trudy rightly mentioned that here we are between Boston and New York. And often, you know, people turn to those metropolitan centers first when they, you know, think of XYZ, when they think of global centers for commerce, when they think for places that recover well from a recession. And I just want to inject this, Lieutenant Governor, and, and we obsess over these data points and we want to put them out there. Moody's is ranking the states these days on their economic recovery. And I'm going to mention it again, Lieutenant Governor. As of this okay. past Friday, this is fresh data. Moody's ranks Rhode Island sixth in the whole country for our comeback since Mo since uh, since COVID on their back to normal index, number six in the whole country, number one in the Northeast. In their recovery, Massachusetts is 47th and New York is 50th. And I just say that to say we are leading the way in our region. We are. Maybe for the first time in memory, we ordinarily are first in, last out uh, with these downturns. We're actually leading the way out of the downturn now. That's why we're seeing such a, tr a tremendous resurgence to the mansions and to the restaurants that Trudy and Joe are describing, but we can't rest on those laurels. We need to keep investing in the sending of the message as Trudy just, just described, so that this continues, so that it's not a blip in time not just a momentary recognition that Rhode Island is such a marvelous place in which to live and in which to work. Now, now, if, if you don't mind that as a preface, Joe, what else can we do to make that message more, how, how can we amplify it? How can we make sure that people are hearing it and how can we make you know, Southern Rhode Island uh, the continuing destination that it, that it is at this moment in time? Okay, so this is an easy one for me. So I'm gonna give you a little different or a real unique perspective. So before I say anything though, I wanna also point out on the relocation, on the people who are making this their first home, this is a bargain, right? We are what, what they say when you're in the bottle, you can't read the label, right? We're inside the bottle and we think Rhode Island is a very expensive place to live. Well, if you live in Fairfield County, Connecticut, the ranch house is 1.2 million and the taxes are 18,000 a year. And you buy a house on Charleston Beach, it's a totally different or near Charleston Beach, totally different cost level there. So, the, but before I go into uh, uh, my sort of input on your question, Stefan, um, so the reason you're gonna get a unique pr perspective from me, when COVID hit, I was a member of the town council in South Kingstown. So, we had a very forward thinking town manager that said we need to get on a Zoom meeting with all the business owners um, once a week. And we need to say we need to ask them what's needed, because remember, a lot of the restaurants were at 50 percent capacity. Eventually, their their bars were closed. Their ability to earn was was really restricted. And it's a big employer in our area. So after about three meetings it became obvious to me that the government the local government was offering um solutions that 
the business community was not embracing. We were offering them things that weren't to them a solution. And it became obvious to me. So one idea was we're going to take all the public parks and we're going to fill them with picnic tables. We're going to number them. And then the restaurants, this is before take it outside, can deliver to those parks to the certain number. No restaurant took us up on it. What what the restaurant said loud and clear was what we'd really like is for the town government to just get out of our way. Right. If I have the ability to do outdoor dining, if I have the space to do outdoor dining, I need you to sort of relax the regulations over the short term. So here's what we did. It's normally a depending on what re, what relief you need, a three to six month process to go take your liquor service outdoors. Our town government, South Kingstown said, we'll guarantee you when you get your application and you'll have a yes or no in 72 hours. And if it's no, within another 72 hours, you'll have, here's what you need to check off to get a yes. Well done. Almost every restaurant that had the ability to move outdoors was outdoors within two weeks. Wow. They had to, they had to buy some concrete you know, barriers so that mm -hmm. people were safe behind them. But, but anyway, the lesson there I thought as a, as a town counselor was, we can offer them all they want. If what they want is just let us figure this out, you know, it was a big investment for some of them. Yeah. They they had to spend a lot of money to take it outside before that grant money was available. So some of this yes. happened in May and June of 2020, and the take it outside wasn't until the fall. So it, at the risk of sounding sort of crude, what you're doing is, is working. I would agree with... Uh, Ms. Cox, that yes, what you're doing, continue to do, but wherever possible, sort of move out of the way. Business yes. business people will figure it out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, Let me and, just and, inject and this other, one. Oh, go ahead, John. Go ahead. Well, I just want to know, we, we love the regulatory point you're making. And during the COVID, you should you should, you should extend your point. So please do. the 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 thing we did with the business restrictions, by the way, is that uh, we ensured that when we were unfortunately doing capacity limits on restaurants, right. one of the things that we said was anything you take outside does not count against your capacity count. limit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the state sent a message that we are going to consider outside to be in that sense unregulated because we knew that take, right. taking it outside was so much safer and it was a signal to towns that they should follow suit if they possibly can. We've got to find more ways to do that. Joe, back to you. What else can we do to, yeah, to, just, to get out just, of the way and to, to make that only, happen yeah, so, so the lieutenant the governor other, hears it? Yeah, the only other uh, restriction that we did put on was as long as it doesn't impact the butters, right? So if you're going to take out dining outdoors on your parking lot and not impact your ability to park the people who want to come, uh, you haven't limited that, but you're now bothering, you know, 20 people in a, in a neighboring residential uh, complex that, you know, we have to be reasonable too. as much as the property owner who owns a restaurant has the right to earn their living. The people next door earn, you you know, have balance. the right to, to quiet. Yeah. So it's finding the balance. And I'm telling you, I am continually impressed by the business community. They'll find that balance to to, to succeed. Lieutenant Governor, that's a great case example. Yes, it is. It is. And I want to thank both of you for all this uh, important information. Um, I want to do a check-in. Is this one final thing you want to communicate with us? Because after that, I want to check in with Ben and see what questions we have, because we're going to take some questions and comments. But is there any final comment? Um, I, I don't know. Um, uh, Trudy, go back to you um, after what you heard. Uh, no, just uh, keep keep going, and I hope we continue to have a great season. Um, I am a little bit concerned about reading the news and the Delta variant, mm -hmm. and it might be valuable to begin to do a little bit of advanced planning, which is like the last thing in the world that government wants to do right now. But if we can uh, approach that crisis if it becomes one slightly differently than we did the first time around, that would be very, very reassuring to all of us who are in business. Um, I don't think, I think there should be a little bit of discussion about how are we going to, if we have to, get back into the game of protection 
and do it in a way, because we learned a lot, do it in a way that is not as uh, onerous as it was the first time around. It was hard for everybody and it was necessary, but. I agree. Yeah, thank you. Um, Let me yeah. check. No, go ahead, Joel. I'll just say that I've said enough, so thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we you have said some it questions. well. Uh, yes, thank you. Very well. Uh, let me check, Ben. Do you have some questions for us for the panel? Hi, everyone. Um, so today we had uh, several um, comments about food tourism, and uh, and also you know adding food trucks into the food tourism for accessibility, and just overall the general. Uh, questions and theme of uh, food and attracting people to Rhode Island with our amazing uh, restaurants and cuisine. Thank you, Ben. And that reminds me, I just want to uh, put a plot. Tina Benderson um, is always reminding us in the comments on Facebook that we have to make business accessible, ADA compliance. So anything that can be done now when uh, the new businesses had are taking it outside or any changes that they can do that is um, customers out there that want to visit your business but they need to be accessible to them so Tina always make sure that to remind us that during our conversations here and um, there is also the, the food um, tourism so that was a question about that that Ben told us about so um, secretary do you want to take that first yeah, I think it's essential that we continue to highlight the food scene in Rhode Island because it's par excellence. Um, it's one of the distinguishing features. On average, you're going to eat far better here than you are anyplace else. And it's just an incredible place to explore. And so many of our establishments are accessible. And there are so many James Beard nominated and award winning chefs. All And Johnson & Wales is here, we know. It's, it's just exemplary and it's all over the state. Um, it's in Joe's territory and it's in Trudy's and it's in the multiple regions of our state. So um, uh, there are restaurant weeks that we should be promoting. Providence's is going right now. It actually goes the 24th of this month. Uh, we have Newport Jazz and Folk coming up and there's all kinds of food truck uh, activities and restaurant specials that are going on all over the state as a result. I think the, the takeaway would be, Lieutenant Governor, into our campaigns, we need to make sure that when we show images, one of them or several of them have to be people enjoying dining in the incredible multiplicity of ways you can in Rhode Island. And we have to keep weaving the theme in because it's something that makes us special. Yeah. I agree with you. I really have been trying to eat my way to Rhode Island. As I <laughs> very nice citizen. Town. <laughs> I'm really enjoying it, some delicious food. So. <laughs> um, follow me. <laughs> but I just want to thank you. I want to thank um, Joe and Trudy for this important conversation and for taking the time. And I want to thank my co-host, um, Secretary Pryor. So, and we're going to be together again doing this yes, tomorrow talking about housing. I yes. think by the end of this, you and me are going to have a show. Oh right? my gosh. And then Thursday <laughs> talking about workforce development. That's right. So. It's just about every day. Every day, every day. <laughs> but I want to thank the three of you for joining me and also Chris Parisi and Director Matt Weldon for the important information. And all of you that tune in today, thank you for watching. And we're going to be back uh, with more information for our uh, small business community, for our business community here in the state of Rhode Island. So looking forward to uh, being here with you to the next time. In the meantime, remember to send us your questions um, any concern that you have, email that to us, to ltgov at ltgov.ri.gov, okay? So um, also Billy Kepner also is adding his contact information. Uh, you can email uh, my office also directly to Billy, and we'll be more than glad to answer your questions and any topics that you would like us to talk about for the next time, let us know, okay? With that... Have a good day.